the Vermont House Government Operations Committee on Tuesday, September 15th. We are uh, meeting to take some more testimony on S-124. Um, and then hopefully by the end of our meeting today, we will have the opportunity to review um, a redraft that incorporates uh, some of the suggestions that we have heard to date. Um, so joining us this morning, um, well, actually, before we get started, uh, thank you, John, for your report during the All House Caucus on the uh, status of S-54. Um, wanted to give just five minutes here for a little um, Q&A or if there was anything that Rob wanted to add to, to your floor report, any questions from committee members about the progress so far. Look at that, John, you, you have answered all their questions. We prepared him well. Nicely done. Okay, um, thank you, John, for, uh, for giving that report and Rob for preparing him well. Um, so we have with us Assistant Attorney General um, Jacob Humbert and uh, we invited you uh, this morning because we understand that you are the AAG who is assigned to the Criminal Justice Training Council. Uh, good morning, everyone. And, and yes, I am. I, that's my understanding in terms of why I've been invited to speak with you all. Um, there are, I guess, some familiar faces. I know uh, Representative <laughs> Gardner, good to see you. Uh, yeah, as, as you'd indicated, Chair, I am uh, Jacob Humbert. I'm an Assistant Attorney General with the Vermont Attorney General's Office. I am within the General Counsel and Administrative Law Division, uh, and specifically within the Administrative Law Unit. And what that means in particular uh, for me, uh, I supervise a number of AAGs within that unit who appear before the Vermont Labor Relations Board, the Vermont Human Rights Commission, and also provide services to the Board of Medical Practice, uh, in addition to, to those duties, I have my, my own caseload involving a, a miscellaneous group of state agency clients uh, stemming the continuum from uh, liquor and lottery to the Department of Libraries to Buildings and General Services uh, and Military Department and, and those types of agencies. And included within that client group, uh, we do have the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. So I do provide general counsel services uh, to that council. Um, and in my role as, uh, as uh, someone who provides general counsel services to the council, uh, I provide sort of one slice of, of what would be the various roles that my office plays within this context. Uh, those variety of roles uh, you know, are sort of multifaceted. You know, one, you know, primarily uh, my office, the attorney general himself is a voting member of the council. Uh, so he does, uh, he does typically appoint a proxy to appear for him and vote in all matters related to council business. Uh, you know, we also have within the AG's office, uh, our criminal division. You know, the criminal division may ultimately prosecute alleged criminal conduct of a certified law enforcement officer. The AGO criminal, uh, excuse me, the AGO civil division also may at times defend the council in civil actions. Uh, in addition, uh, Attorney General Donovan you may take certain public policy positions for the AGO and may advocate for certain outcomes, including legislative initiatives that may relate to criminal justice. And the AGO itself also may testify before legislative committees on issues of law, including criminal justice issues. Uh, but my role is, as I said, for general counsel services. So I don't play a role in any of those other circumstances, but I do provide general counsel services specifically to the council. Those general counsel services do include providing legal advice related to statutory and regulatory issues uh, in the administration of, of the programs of the council. It involves uh, advice and counsel concerning rulemaking efforts. It involves contract review. Uh, it involves working with council staff regarding unprofessional conduct complaints and investigations. And it ultimately uh, you know, can culminate in appearing before uh, the council uh, on behalf of the state uh, to look to prosecute unprofessional conduct contested case hearings. I also serve a role as staffing the regular council meetings that uh, have 
that occur uh, monthly roughly at this point in time. Uh, in terms of the unprofessional conduct context, in terms of the services I provide there, um, I, as I said, I do provide counsel to staff in the course of reviewing complaints and investigations uh, related to unprofessional conduct complaints. But when an unprofessional conduct case is to be brought before the council, which sits as a quasi-judicial body and will uh, determine whether or not uh, unprofessional conduct had occurred and would determine what sanction would be imposed uh, if indeed that conduct had occurred. I, I don't serve a typical general counsel role. As I said, I, I serve an administrative prosecutorial function there. And so whenever there is a case that's brought before the council, a contested case proceeding, the council relies upon a different attorney, a separately contracted legal counsel. Uh, his name is Wesley Lawrence uh, with the Terrio and Jocelyn firm in Montpelier. And he advises the council in the conduct of those unprofessional conduct contested case hearings, drafting decisions, ruling on evidentiary objections and such. Uh, so you know, that's sort of a broad brush synopsis of, of you know, what contact my office has with the council and what in particular my role would be by way of general counsel services. Great, thank you. Um, have you had an opportunity to review um, the parts of S-124 that envision um, changes to the Criminal Justice Training Council? I, I have reviewed, uh, but not in great detail. Uh, I, I understood that the committee was looking to have me appear to answer a, a couple questions. Uh, so that was what I was aware of. Uh, certainly, uh, given my role, general counsel role, here, I, I certainly am not in a position to provide uh, my office's perspective on any particular bill. You know, I would defer any requests for an AGO position to our Deputy Attorney General, Josh Diamond, on those questions. And likewise, given my general counsel role, I wouldn't be in a position to provide a council position on a bill uh, or provide you know, something by way of, of any formal feedback on what, what its position may be. I would have to defer again, to council staff for that purpose. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, questions from committee members, John Gannon. Thank you, and, and Jacob, thank you for testifying this morning. Um, so the state requires any person who's gonna obtain a license um, or certification or registration um, uh, in order to practice a profession, sign a statement that they don't have any unpaid judgments, restitution orders, child support, or have any um, owed taxes. Um, do you know if the council is requiring law enforcement officers, uh, applicants to answer these four good standing questions as many other professions do? Uh, yesterday when I heard of the, of the committee's interest in speaking with me, uh, I, I did review uh, what Ledge Council had put together by way of their memo, and that was one of the questions included there. So I did reach out to council staff and I asked them, you know, to point me in the direction of whatever form they have, which would provide those good standing certifications uh, by way of these applicants for, for law enforcement certification purposes. I have not yet heard back uh, definitively on whether the forms address that question. Uh, but I did also reach out to the council management team to let them know that this is an outstanding question the committee has. And they certainly expressed a willingness that if their forms don't specifically address these issues, that they would amend the forms to address those required issues. Uh, but uh, Representative Gannon, you're, you're right. There, there are a myriad of certifications uh, that are required for professional licensees. And you, know, you typically see this um, addressed through a, you know, a fairly you know, focused way through some form, some application, something that the applicant will have to check a box and sign and certify. Sometimes it has to be certification under the pains and penalties of perjury as well. So, you know, it can be, it can be quite important. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, in circumstances you know, like this, um, within the council context, I know it's pretty form intensive. Uh, you know, I did take a look through the website just to check to see if I could find forms that specifically address this question. And nothing came came up with my initial search, but uh, as I said, if this is not being addressed by the council forms, I I'm committed to working with the council to make sure their forms are updated to address those 
required certifications. At least there are four that, that the, the committee has, has identified, uh, and I, I can work with the council to ensure that those four are addressed and if there are any others that may be out there as well. Thank you for that answer. And, and just one other question. Um, you mentioned that I, I believe it's Wesley Lawrence, who's an attorney in private practice, um, advises the council. Is, is that unusual um, for a council to have independent counsel that's not? It, 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 it's a common practice, uh, at least in my world, you know, in terms of the, the uh, departments I'm aware of. Uh, you know, the, the idea here is that typically you'll have, you know, based on the statutory authority that the Attorney General's office has, you will have this general counsel function fulfilled by the AG's office. But when the AG's office takes on, you know, the administrative prosecutorial hat, puts it on, uh, in order to create enough separation between the quasi-judicial body and my office, typically you'll have either contracted counsel or some other counsel uh, in state government not affiliated with the AG's office advising that quasi-judicial body. So there's no conflict of interest. There's no confusion as to who is advising uh, the board, the body, the council in, in the conduct of that proceeding. Uh, you know, in the, in the bodies I appear before, for example, uh, the Department of Liquor and Lottery, I do also provide general counsel services to that department, but they also have uh, administrative licensing enforcement hearings. And I take my general counsel hat off and put my administrative prosecutor hat on and I appear before that board and I will prosecute liquor licensing enforcement cases. In those circumstances, uh, they also have contracted with private counsel. Coincidentally, uh, Mr. Lawrence as well uh, for that board. Uh, you do also <laughs> see that same dynamic in the board of medical practice context uh, where you have uh, a, a hearing panel that will sit and consider allegations of unprofessional conduct against a licensed physician, for example. In those circumstances, uh, former Judge Belcher serves as counsel to those hearing committees for the board, uh, and you have an AAG that would appear to prosecute that licensing matter. So it is common in my, in my world. I can't speak for, for you know, what's done outside the administrative law context, but it, it is fairly common in my experience. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Al Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Jacob, for your testimony. I just have a simple question. Um, when there's a prosecutorial case and the training council retains private counsel, do you interact in any way to provide any context or historical perspective of, of what's happening? Well, the, 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 private counsel that would serve to provide legal services to, in this case, the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council serves as that, um, you know, that point of contact for the parties, essentially. Uh, you know, ha having that individual attorney there uh, ensures that there will not be ex parte, you know, and sort of out of, out of court statements with the decision maker, essentially. Um, and so there, that can be an open line of communication between you know, myself and the other party uh, and the attorney representing the council, certainly to the extent that there would be any kind of settlement discussions uh, and any sort of uh, you know, proposed settlements to resolve a case, you know, the parties would bring that to the attorney or the public body. In this case, Mr. Lawrence uh, would offer up their agreement in principle, would provide context, and would give that attorney for the council the information necessary to, to uh, determine whether or not what is proposed is a reasonable resolution. Uh, and certainly, you know, short of stipulations and things like that, during the course of a proceeding, you know, once a notice of hearing is filed and a case is begun, uh, there may be contacts between the parties and the representatives and the attorney for the council related to pre-hearing issues, you know, whether there are any sort of questions about notice, or in discovery issues, scheduling issues, those types of things. So, you know, the, the attorney for the council in this case is that sort of central point of contact for the parties and would be the first point of contact. And the parties would not be engaging in conversations with council members uh, related to a pending matter without the attorney for the council being involved in those discussions. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Any other questions from committee members? All right, seeing none, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Humbert for being with us this morning. Um, we appreciate you helping us understand a bit more how the legal support of the Criminal Justice Training Council is organized. Um, You're welcome. You are welcome to stick with us if you would like. We have a, uh, another issue to bring up and then we're gonna go through another draft of the bill and I would also welcome you to take a look at that draft when it goes up on the committee page and uh, reach out to us via email if you have any thoughts. Thank you so much. Nice Thanks. to see you, Jacob. Thank you Good for to testifying. See. Well, you're very welcome. Good to see you as well. All right, so committee, I'd like to go next to Representative Christie of Hartford um, because he has been working um, in a small group uh, on the outside of this issue, um, but relating to one of the requests that we heard during our public hearing process. Um, and that request was to uh, not only make sure that we're doing race data collection with respect to um, traffic stops, but also that we are using our government accountability committee function to uh, understand how, um, how our um, black and brown neighbors are doing more generally um, in, in all areas of, um, of life here in Vermont. And so I wanted to invite uh, Kevin Christie to share a little bit about the recommendation that he's been working towards, and then we will uh, hear from um, Susanna Davis after that. So take it away, Coach. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Uh, committee members, uh, it's great to see you, even if virtually. <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, frame uh, this uh, potential uh, amendment uh, to our existing uh, statute with regard to uh, government accountability. And what's interesting to me, and I think uh, you'll find uh, uh, the same, is, is that w we can only fix what we measure. And we've had that discussion at a number of times around different topics uh, that we work on uh, in different committees. And looking at the state outcomes, there's no direct mention of people of color, indigenous people, and as we look at the report itself, and, and I, I took, did a little uh, digging uh, and looked at the most recent report, looked at the statute itself, and basically, we're just not asking the question at all. Um, when, you, when you have an opportunity, uh, I think uh, 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 our alleged counsel, uh, uh, Betsy Ann, uh, probably shared uh, with you the uh, three VSA 2311, which actually documents um, those outcomes. Uh, and then uh, most recently, once a year, the Government Accountability Committee, which is a standing committee of the legislature, uh, meets and reviews the actual indicators. Uh, and so for all 10 outcomes, there are a number of indicators. And just to give a quick example, under uh, number one, which is Vermont has a, has a prosperous economy. Well, it would be important to know how many net new jobs we have. Well, take that one step further. 
it would also be good for us to know the impact of those new jobs on people of color, indigenous people. We look at the next one, letter C under number one, and it says net new business establishments. Well, for those of us that are looking at trying to support uh, our neighbor uh, Vermonters in developing new enterprise, it would be a good number for us to be able to look at that impact on our economic development and how that's affecting our growth in that area. It's not there. <laughs> uh, we are not asking that question, so we don't know. And and as as you can see, what we're we're asking is is that we start looking at that. And and I think it it, it makes sense. Um, I think what brought me to Vermont uh, in the in the early '70s was to start my own business. And uh, as an enterprise, um, that um, it was formative for me, you know, as a as a young entrepreneur, um, and. As oh. <laughs> so, Coach, I think your cat may have muted you. Sorry about that. Two new kittens, right? <laughs> oh, that's fun. It'll happen again then. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> hopefully, I don't lose my train of thought in between, right? <laughs> But, but as, as I was referring to uh, uh, the economic development component, um, you know, we granted uh, several million dollars for uh, uh, women and minority businesses in our CARES Act money. <sighs> Having those indicators show us what the impact is, is critical. Because if we're investing funds in different areas of state government, uh, it would be good for us to know. Um, move, moving along, uh, under Vermonters are healthy, uh, which is the second outcome. We could do the same thing. Um, Right now, there is no reference uh, to uh, people of color, indigenous uh, Vermonters. And yet they're asking the question, number of accidental suicides, uh, percent of adults who are obese. As we looked at COVID, and I think the, what's probably brought this to our attention uh, uh, most vividly, you know, is as uh, Susanna Davis will talk to you later uh, about, was we asked the health department to look at race-based data as far as COVID cases went. And what we found is what has been noticed across the country that people of color, indigenous people, disenfranchised Vermonters as well, had a higher propensity for having the virus affect them than others. Um, so again, uh, having these indicators look at the effects um, and in an actuality, a lot of this is being collected, but we're not reporting it, you know, within one simple framework. When, when you have a chance to, to look at some of the reporting formats uh, that uh, 
the government accounting ability, excuse me, uh, committee uh, puts forth in their report. Uh, there's a number of tabs that allows you to drill down into the numbers. And, and I was, I was looking at that and I'm going, but it's not telling me anything. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's telling me something, but it's not telling me the whole story. Um, so, so that that's problematic, uh, as, as we can see. Uh, so basically, uh, to, to not, um, uh, take up too much more of your time around uh, this, uh, the granular uh, parts of what we're suggesting, because one of the things that we found out doing the research for this uh, with uh, Betsy Ann is, is that the GAC already has the authority to adjust those indicators. It's just nobody's asked them to, you know? Uh, so basically, by adding this uh, addition, you know, to statute, uh, which speaks to uh, the state outcomes report and the responsibility uh, and functionality of the government accounting committee, the population level indicators demonstrating quality of life for Vermonters who are black, indigenous, or people of color. What that does is it's opening up that area of questioning so that we as legislators, as we develop our policy, as we develop our spending, we have a clearer point of reference. And, you know, as, as you go through this, you'll see very clearly, even down to um, uh, the areas of fair and impartial policing, all of that can be extrapolated into that report in one central area. Uh, and, and that does have an effect on the quality of life for all uh, Vermonters. Uh, so I think at this point, I'll, uh, uh, I, I think we've set the, the stage, so to speak. Madam Chair. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, committee, any questions for Representative Christie? All right. Um, so next, I would like to invite Susanna Davis um, to share with us the, uh, her perspective on, um, on tasking the GAC with collecting this data. And uh, is there anything you think we need to know about um, calling for the collection of this data? Good afternoon. Sorry, I have to like my name. We have you on two devices, so we probably need to probably need to scrap one of the devices. Um, sorry, my uh, connection hasn't been stable lately, so I've had to have a backup device on just in case I get picked off. So, I mean, I think, first of all, thank you for inviting me for the reference to Shana Davis, Racial Equity Director for the State of Vermont. Um, I am grateful to Representative Christie for laying out the issue as uh, thoroughly as he has. I don't really have a whole lot to add. Uh, I, th I think that, broadly speaking, the collection of race data in Vermont is going to make or break our efforts around equity. And not just equity, not just racial equity, but equity for all marginalized groups, which includes LGBTQIA plus community, people living with disabilities, people experiencing socioeconomic disparity, um, sex, gender identity, et cetera. So collecting race data actually has a monumental ripple effect for all of these other groups because it helps to drill down where the disparities are in a way that broadly collecting data that's not segregated by race cannot do. I'll give one example. 
um, we often talk about, let's just say median household income. And we track the ways that household income has increased or decreased over time in Vermont. But if we were to collect these data more accurately with racial disaggregation, then what we'll find is that median, ho median household income varies widely between racial groups in the state. We have a large number of white Vermonters living in poverty, but we have a wider share a percentage or rate of Vermonters of color uh, living in poverty. And so when we look at the statistical likelihood of a person who's gonna be living in poverty or a person who's going to experience joblessness or houselessness at some point in his or her life. Um, when we look at the statistical likelihood of dying of COVID compared to another racial or ethnic group, these are data that we would not be able to accurately collect and act on were it not for the accurate collection of race disaggregated data. I'll stop there because um, I don't want to go off too much on this tangent if you all are satisfied with, with that information. Is there any um, particular issue here that I can speak to that would be useful for the committee? That's an excellent question. Committee, um, any, any urgent questions that pop up in your mind? All right, I'm not seeing them diving towards their little blue hands. So I think we will um, go next to the draft that we have um, of the bill that will uh, incorporate some of these uh, data collection points um, within our government accountability um, section of statute. And so uh, I would welcome you to get back in touch with us. You're certainly welcome to stay with us and, and uh, listen to the committee deliberations um, for the next hour and a half or so, but would also welcome you to get back in touch with us if there's anything about the words on the page that give you pause, or if you can think of ways that, um, that you might strengthen them. Thank you. Actually, I do have one um, small suggestion and I'm happy to follow up on this one uh, by email. Uh, I do think that it's worth include adding to the language of intent in the purpose section of the um, of the Act 186 population level outcomes to include language specifying or clarifying that each of the listed outcomes is designed to achieve equity for all Vermonters across all groups and particularly marginalized Vermonters, including but not limited to uh, different racial groups, ethnic groups, um, LGBTQIA plus community, people living with disabilities, youth, seniors, et cetera. I think that adding that language to the purpose statement would help to clarify that even if you don't see a group expressly named here, that through the indicators that we'll be collecting, like disaggregating data through those indicators and through our general intent, we will be ensuring that we're addressing the needs of all of these groups, particularly marginalized groups. So I think that um, it, it would go a long way to, to send that message and to advance that work. I appreciate and I'm, that. I'm happy to workshop some of the language. Great, thank you so much, I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you for being with us. Um, next, I would like to go to Betsy Ann. Um, and um, I would assume at this point, we've got a document, a uh, new draft up on our committee page. Hello, good morning, Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council. I can point it out to you where it exists on your uh, webpage today. Thank you to Andrea for posting all the documents. If you do go to today's date, um, the second to the last document is S124, Draft 2.1 with today's date, the annotated strike all. This is your running draft uh, strike all amendment to S124. That contains the potential draft language that is in here addressing uh, indicators for Vermonters who are BIPOC. Um, and that is on page 21 in the uh, draft section B. And Madam Chair, I can also share screen if you think that'd be helpful for us to take a look at it now or members. Can yeah, just why don't we go ahead and do that? We'll, we'll share screen for this particular section. And then when we start the, uh, the full walkthrough of the annotated draft, we'll go back to our own devices. 
Sounds good. I'm going to share screen. And can you see it okay? Yes. Great, thank you. So here we are on page uh, 21, I believe, and it's in this section B. And just for reference to discuss, just repeat some of what Rep Christie was discussing at the beginning. So we already have in law in 3 VSA 2311, the requirement, um, or first the, the General Assembly set these 10 outcomes for the state, their quality of life outcomes. There are 10 of them now addressing our economy, our health, environment, um, families, our elders, our Vermonters with disabilities, our government and our infrastructure. And then in sub C, there's a process where the GAC, the Government Accountability Committee, has the current law authority to establish the indicators, which is the data that helps demonstrate the state's progress in reaching these quality of life outcomes for our state. And what this language that um, you've been discussing this morning would do is require the GAC to establish new indicators to address the quality of life of Vermonters who are black, indigenous, or people of color. And so this language would provide that by next March, the GAC would be required to consult with the Executive Director of Racial Equity, the Social Equity Caucus, and the Chief Performance Officer and accept recommendations from other relevant entities in order to approve by that March 1st date, population level indicators that demonstrate the quality of life for Vermonters who are black, indigenous, or people of color, or BIPOC. As those indicators relate to those population level quality of life outcomes that are already set in forth in statute, that list of 10 there in 3 VSA 2311B. So it goes on to provide that once those indicators are approved by GAC, the chief performance officer would report on those indicators in the state outcomes report. So the whole point of the state outcomes and the indicators um, is to put them into the state outcomes report. Um, I just have a link of it. Let's see if I can just move this tab out of the way. Here we go. I just have it up here on the screen. This is your state outcomes report. This is the 2019 one where the chief performance officer puts all the data together for each of those um, outcomes and uh, submits a report that shows how well the state is progressing in achieving those 10 quality of life outcomes. I'll stop share for now, unless uh, Madam Chair, committee members have any questions for me on some of this language. So committee, any, any questions for Betsy Ann on this particular part of the draft? All right, I'm not seeing anybody diving into their little blue hand. So thank you for drawing our attention um, specifically to that point. Um, and committee will give you some time to, to mull this over as we go back to the beginning and start with a, a full run through of a draft of the bill. Um, so committee, any other questions for either Coach Christie, Susanna Davis, or Jacob Humbert before we start going over the draft? I wanna just recognize that one or all of them might choose to, um, to, to, to take off while we're going through the draft. Mike Merwicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. What I'd like to do is, uh, at least for myself, if not the committee is, um, to thank Susanna and Coach for their input and to, uh, to stay open to their ongoing input to this. I think it's, it's invaluable what they've brought uh, to these deliberations and I, and I hope we can continue to depend on um, <clears throat> their help in crafting this legislation. Thank you. And um, I will echo my appreciation and thanks as well for the input on this. This has been uh, very helpful. And I think it's also a, a really good addition to, uh, to the bill. Um, Kevin Christie. Uh, Madam Chair, th thank you all. You know, this, as, as we know, this is, this is a, a team sport, the work that we do. <laughs> You know, I, I have to use my coaching metaphors, you know, but uh, <laughs> that being said, um, 
I would like to suggest that maybe uh, being that uh, the House uh, co-chair uh, of the GAC uh, is Maida Thompson, uh, Townsend, uh, you, you might want to um, uh, ask if she has any thoughts uh, relating uh, to this, you know, as our co-chair, because there's a Senate and House uh, co-chairs to the GAC, to the Government Accountability Committee. Um, so anyway, just a thought. I appreciate that reminder. Um, if we were all in the building, of course, that would yeah, be right. <laughs> much easier to do, but we will, uh, with some intention, um, make sure that we draw her attention to this so that she can give us any um, feedback that she has. Great. Uh, any other questions from committee members? All right, so let us um, all find our second device and get Betsy's draft 2.1 with today's date, fresh at 11 a.m. I don't think it could get any fresher. And I'll start when you're ready, Madam Chair, if you'd like me to start walking through. Uh, uh, yep, let's go ahead and get started on that. All right. So if you're all looking at draft 2.1, this is the annotated draft strike all just to keep a running tab of potential amendments to the bill. Um, I put these uh, draft 2.1 potential amendments together at the direction of the chair for your review and discussion today. Um, and these amendments cover a variety of topics. So just to look at the format again of my tricky annotated strike all convention, um, if something's in yellow, it would be added to the bill and then anything in red strike through, it would be removed from the bill. So on the first page, when you pull it up, the bill gets into um, potential amendments to the Criminal Justice Training Council chapter. And just to note um, in this section one, uh, when A is highlighted in yellow, um, you can see there's no underlining. That's just to show that um, the bill would include current law A. That's the current law A in regard to the council. Um, in the bill as passed the Senate, there were just the three asterisks there to not show that language, but it seemed uh, that it would be helpful to show, in this case, what the creation and purpose of the council is, so that A is just shown for reference, but there would be no change to the current law language of the A. But you can see when the General Assembly initially established the council, it was to promote the public health, safety, and welfare, and to be in the public interest to create the council. So going through another thing that you'll see, um, I've just flagged for you the potential new amendments with um, green highlighting with today's date, just to show that these are the new amendments. So you can see at the bottom of page one, that new language for B1 that would be added in regard to that recruit terminology correction, change to be basic training for law enforcement applicants. That was already, um, you had already discussed that in your draft 1.1. So no change there, but just a reminder um, this was just an updating to say that the council provides basic training for law enforcement applicants. Those are people who want to become officers and then in service training, which is annual, by the way, for officers who are already certified. And so, as you had already discussed that elimination of the um, phrase recruit because testimony on the Senate side indicated that the council's preference is to not use uh, the term recruit and instead try to use the term law enforcement applicant. But one of the things um, discussing for this new draft is to uh, also ensure that there's a description that the council is also created now um, to maintain at the top of page two, statewide standards of law enforcement officer professional conduct by accepting and tracking complaints alleging officer unprofessional conduct, adjudicating, adjudicating charges of unprofessional conduct, and imposing sanctions on the certification of an officer who the council finds has committed unprofessional conduct. 
So there's no change to the actual council authority to do that. That was already enacted pursuant to 2018's Act 56. But this is just an update to the statute because the overall description of the council in this first section of the council chapter um, just did not address that the council also has that duty to main those, maintain those statewide standards of officer professional conduct. Because that's the purpose of the professional regulation subchapter of the council is to maintain those statewide standards um, by the council's authority to um, impose discipline on an officer's certification, which is different from discipline that an individual agency might impose on an officer um, because that individual agency's discipline um, is more of a labor issue. It's applicable only to the officer at his or her agency, whereas the purpose of the council is to uh, potentially impose discipline on an officer's certification to uphold statewide standards. Um, any discipline would on an officer certification would travel um, and, uh, along with officer certification statewide. So that's a potential new amendment there in B2 at the top of page two to further describe the council's duty to do that. Um, on page two, on line six, there is also a potential updating amendment that the council shall offer and approve programs of instruction because the council not only offers um, educational programs and training programs for officers, but it can also approve programs which may be offered outside of the academy itself. And then finally, on page two, on line nine, just adding the current law D, there's no change to D, um, but it's just showing the D for reference, um, which is the council's responsibility to encourage governmental units in the law enforcement program and to aid in the establishment of adequate training facilities. That's a current law responsibility and just shown there for reference. So I'll pause there, see if there's any questions. All right. I don't see any. All right. So we'll, we can move on to section two. This is in regard to the membership of the council. And uh, there are contained in this draft potential revisions to the council membership. Uh, as you recall, as the bill passed the Senate, the council membership would be um, enlarged to a membership of 20 individuals. And this draft 2.1 would uh, further revise some of those members and increase the membership to a total number of 21. On page two, the first changes would be to remove the commissioner of corrections or designee um, as a current law member of the council. Commissioner of corrections is currently given a seat on the council and this language would remove the commissioner of corrections from the council membership and also remove the uh, Senate's proposal to add the commissioner of mental health to the council membership. Those two members would be removed and then on the next page, there would be members added. If you wanna scroll over to page three, actually page four, None of the membership on page three would be changed, but in this draft 2.1 um, on page four, uh, there would be, instead of three public members appointed by the governor, there would be six public members overall with two additional appointees given to the governor and then additional appointee um, that would be appointed or jointly elected by the memberships of the Vermont chapters of the NAACP. In regard to these public members overall, if you're looking at page four, starting on line five, there is a description of what it means to be a public member. Um, the description as passed the Senate was that public members shall not be a law enforcement officer or have a spouse, child, parent, or sibling who's an officer, can't be current legislators, 
or otherwise employed in the criminal justice system. Um, so as passed the Senate, the governor would get to appoint three public members. Um, this draft on line nine would change that to five public members appointed by the governor, um, but specifically require that at least one of them would need to be a social worker and at least one of them would have to have personal experience of living with a mental condition or psychiatric disability. So that would partly it's from removing the first two commissioner appointees at the beginning. That's where the extra two would go. And then the additional member, the sixth public member on line 13 is a public member jointly elected by the memberships of the Vermont chapters of the NAACP. As I understand it from looking at the Secretary of State's Corporations Division and registry and looking online, it does not appear that there is one Vermont chapter overall of the NAACP, but there are individual chapters for regions of the state. There's a Rutland area. NAACP, there's a Wyndham County NAACP, and then I understand there's also a Champlain, uh, Champlain area NAACP. This language would require those chapters to jointly elect um, a public member for the council. And so that would just, there's just, um, just to note that this would require um, the chapters to be able to get together um, and jointly elect a member to the council. But that may be workable in practice um, well, through electronic means. Marcia Gardner has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I guess it's several weeks ago now, we did a count of the positions on this board and counting which ones would represent law enforcement and which ones would represent other entities. I thought we came up with a count of 12 and eight, but there are 21 members, not 20. Um, so that's a question that I have. And also I'm hoping that at some point we can revisit this to see if we should create more balance on this uh, board. Um, Madam Chair, to, res I, to respond to that and putting this draft together um, with your direction, the I, I, as I understood it, part of that was to address that balance issue. Um, and so when we counted before your right, Representative Gardner, it was eight and 12 with eight being not a law enforcement connection and the 12 being with a law enforcement connection. And so removing the commissioner of corrections, that would be removing a law enforcement connection. Um, so that would bring it down to 11. Then adding um, the two new members, um, the two new public members, that would bring it up to 10. Um, and for the non law enforcement connection, and then the six member appointed by uh, NAACP chapters would be an additional uh, 11. So I think we're uh, there, you're about balanced, but we can do another count through Representative Gardner um, to go through this membership again if you do want to. <clears throat> Uh, try to weigh out what the connections are to law enforcement or non-law enforcement. Um, no, I'm happy with that. Thank you. I think I may have missed some some things last week, so um, I'm I do see more balance in that committee than we had before. Thank you. Bob Hooper has a question. Oh, but see, and this may be an inane point, but in I there, you designate one of whom shall be a social worker, having spent 25 years as a social worker, but having no formal social work education or certification, and knowing that the National Association of Social Workers is very ter territorial, is that uh, too fine a point or something that will be misconstrued? 
ill-defined maybe oh i don't i don't know if i i fully understand your question or the concern about social workers well if somebody's going to be appointed as a social worker and they aren't a member of the national association or don't have a formal social work background yeah. or certification but their background is having spent a career as a social worker is that going to raise an issue well, I don't know the answer to that. Right now, I'd say the language is a general social worker. And so I think it would be up to the governor. If this language were enacted as is, it would be up to the governor to determine whether someone counts as a social worker. If you wanted to make it more specific, potentially you could say you could require a licensed social worker, or if that's not the direction that you would want to go, you could just further describe um, any certain qualifications that the person might have to have as a social worker. No, I'm just asking the question, not making a suggestion. Mike Merwicki has a question. Uh, I think I can add something to what uh, Representative Hooper shared. There, there used to be a designation within, uh, within the Department for Children and Families of social worker, which somebody could have without having the credentials as a social worker. This was within yeah. the Family Services Division. Okay. And several years ago, we did away with that. And those workers are now called family service workers. So, so now there are no people, as far as I understand, within state government or otherwise, who are called social workers without having the credentials. And um, the chair of human services could certainly shed more light on that if we need. Yeah, you're bringing back uh, some memories from a prior OPR bill now that you're saying that. Are you all set, Mike? Okay. Betsy Ann, back to the draft. Yeah. At the bottom of this page four, we're still in the council membership on line 16. There is a new proposal that the governor would appoint the chair of the council from among the public members that are set forth in subdivision A1N. So that N, is what currently starts on line five, and it is those six described public members as currently written. What I've done is flagged here for you the question of um, if you will pursue uh, this uh, public member language, and it comes with a couple, two special provisions as a public member. One, under this new language on line 16, the governor would appoint the chair of the council from among the public members. And then down below, as currently written in subsection C on line 19, um, as passed the Senate, the public members would get a per diem compensation, the $50 per diem. Um, but none of the other members would, but all members would be entitled to reimbursement of expenses. So I just flagged the question for you as to whether there are other members of the council, either under this current uh, draft or any future draft that should be considered a public member. Um, for example, some appointees up above page four and page three. The question is as to whether any of those should be public members that should be placed down in uh, subdivision N, so they would be able to uh, potentially be chair. Sorry, I'm getting the unstable net, unstable internet. I'm still here. Are you still I'm still here with you? Yeah, we're we're hearing Am you, but you're I... you're a bit garbled, and um, your your video has frozen a couple times. But I think I think we got the gist of it. We need okay. to consider whether there are other per diems that should be granted for people who may be considered members of the public. Got it, thank you. Um, I have Jim Harrison with a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanna make sure I understand the change here. Uh, we had the chief of the Brandon Police Department last week, and I believe he said he was the current chair. Did I understand him correctly that the chair is currently elected by the Council membership? 
Okay, so this would change it and put essentially um, a non law enforcement official uh, or representative as chair of the training council to train law enforcement. Do I have that correct? Yes, chair of the council, yes, to train and uh, certify and professionally regulate, yes. And I believe that the ch current chair, the chief, um, indicated that you're right, Representative Harrison, that it was pursuant to the council's current authority, I believe their separate statutory authority to establish their rules of procedure. And so I think that's where that current, um, that's, that's where they uh, have currently used the uh, council election of its own chair. And this would change that to say that the governor appoints a chair who's one of the public members. Okay, thank you. Rob LeClaire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, along the line with Jim's question there, I, I have to say I have some concerns about this particular language in that we're automatically limiting the governor's ability to, to pick who can chair. And we're also limiting it to people who have arguably no law enforcement experience. Um, I, I have to say, I find that a little concerning here. Um, I, I think personally, we're going to need to go back and, and visit this. Always happy to have a conversation. Um, we can certainly uh, tee up uh, some committee discussion after we get done going through the uh, the draft 2.1, and I will log this as one of the areas that we'd like to discuss some more. Go ahead, Betsy Ann. Thank you. Let's see. We are on page five in that section three, a new subsection B would be added to state explicitly that the new members would need to be appointed by November 15th of this year. Um, that has um, impacts on other parts of the bill because it does impact the uh, reports back in section 10A um uh, uh some of which must come from the council and so um this new membership would be uh for example the the um revised membership would be the ones that are reporting back in addition to the standard council duties um pursuant to law i am scrolling through there were no um there would be no changes right now to the general description of council powers and duties. Um, I'll just note um, on page six, looking at that current language as passed the Senate um, for the council um, being required to offer courses of instruction in different areas of the straight state and striving to offer non overnight courses whenever possible. I think you heard testimony from the council last Friday um, that they do uh, try to offer courses in different areas of the state and the non there are non overnight courses. I think um, the testimony indicated that, that was essentially the status quo except for the uh, basic training for law enforcement applicants who are by council rule currently required to do that um, 16 week Monday through Friday overnight training at the academy. But aside, I, I believe the, the council testified that aside from that basic training requirement that um, the council does not um, require overnight courses. Just to make Jim Harrison. Yeah, thank you, Betsy. And, um... Maybe you skipped over it or I missed it, but on page five, you said the new membership of the council shall be appointed on or before November 15th. Um, given that um, if this makes it to the finish line, it's not going to get signed into law until possibly as late as October 1st. Um, that just seems kind of a rush to 
find the right people um, and get them appointed um, right now. So I just I just flag it. Um, we may want to consider a later date. That's all. Got it noted. Thank you. I am scrolling through section five on page seven. I just flagged for you on page seven on line six. There is currently no language changes from what the Senate passed as to that requirement for the council to structure its program so that by next July, a level two certified officer would uh, be able to transition to level three certification using either portfolio experiential learning or CLEP testing. And I just flagged that for you because my notes from the chief um, last Friday was that um, the council would need to have additional resources to make that happen um, by that date. So I'm just, I just flagged that issue. Um, in case you will want to revisit that because the council feedback was that it was, um, as I understood their testimony, it was um, not something that they would be able to accomplish under their current resources. In section six here on page seven, line 16, um, the as passed Senate version had a report back from the executive director of the council to the GovOps committees regarding their council's plans to change um, some of the training in accordance with the requirements up above. Um, and you heard testimony from the council last week about them being on the um, in the process of getting a new executive director. So uh, the suggestion was to provide the council with additional time to report back so it can get its new executive director established. Um, and so this would extend that report back um, from January 15 of next year to March 1st of next year for the new executive director to report back on um, the plans and it's for its changing its training. But otherwise, this language in regard to the report back and the rulemaking requirement um, that's up above in the bill, you can see on page eight, line seven, as passed the Senate, that uh, the language would require the rulemaking for the alternate routes to certification. Um, it would be July 1, 23, as currently written. I will move down to section 6A. So this was the language as passed the Senate that uh, council services, which would include training at the police academy and any other services provided by the council um, would be prohibited for any agency that's not in compliance with the uh, collecting roadside stop data or any other policies required under the council chapter. And you had heard from Representative Donahue, I believe last week on her suggestion to make a similar change about um, the language that you had in S219 that would make state grants contingent upon agencies being in compliance with this roadside stop collection data. And her recommendation to this committee was to also make uh, the state grant authority contingent on the adding in the requirement that an agency also has to be in compliance with the current law requirement to report any uh, interactions that an agency's officer has in responding to what appears to be a mental health crisis and there's death or serious bodily injury uh, that uh, occurred during that interaction between law enforcement with law enforcement. And so she had made a request to this committee to add on to the S219 grant language. And that proposal by Representative Donahue was similar to this language as passed the Senate to make council services um, contingent upon compliance with current law 
requirements for agencies to collect roadside stop data and be in compliance with any other policies. This would add um, the language that Representative Donahue was requesting in that other area to say that council services are also contingent on an agency re reporting to the AG's office as is required by current law, um, any death or serious bodily injuries when an officer responds to a mental health crisis. So this language would be added here. And um, Representative Donahue's specific request appears later in the bill. Rob LeClaire has a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm, I'm, wouldn't this information be reported regardless of what caused it, if that was the outcome of the interaction? So there is this current law requirement. It's in 18 VSA section 7257A. This is the statute that established the Mental Health Crisis Response Commission within the Office of AG. And within that statute, in subsection B, there's a specific requirement that says each incident involving an interaction between law enforcement and a person acting in a manner that created reason to believe a mental health crisis was occurring that results in death or serious bodily injury to any party shall be referred to the office of AG by the relevant law enforcement agency um, for review analysis and recommendations within 60 days of the incident. Um, so it, I think the big picture is that it is a requirement imposed on agencies right now under current law and I believe what I understood Representative Donahue to be saying was that if these bills will address um, the benefits of state resources like grants, or in this case, council services um, that would potentially go to law enforcement agencies, um, so long as they're in compliance with their current law requirements, that it should be added that um, to be able to enjoy those state resources, agencies need to be in compliance with that current law requirement to report the uh, serious um, bodily injury or death when an officer or an agency is responding to, to a mental health crisis. But I think partially part of the um, part of this language is to try to help ensure that agencies are complying with their current law requirements for reporting in this case to the AG. Okay, um, I guess do we, you probably don't know this, but do we have any examples of where something like that's happened and it hasn't been reported? I do not know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Thank you, Betsy Ann. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to keep scrolling. I'm on page nine, no change here. Um, once we get to section eight, there is that new proposal to require any potential hiring agency to contact an officer's current agency for that current agency to disclose the officer's performance there. It's already a current law requirement for a potential hiring agency to contact an officer's former agency if an officer is no longer employed as an officer. While there would be no change under this draft to that language as past the Senate, but on page 11, if you scroll up, um, you'll see that there was that transitional provision in section nine that would say that that new proposed requirement for a uh, a current agency to disclose an officer's performance at that agency shall not apply if there's a binding non-disclosure agreement prohibiting that disclosure that was executed prior to the effective day of that section. And so that the chair asked for language that would um, prohibit moving forward um, any language in a collective bargaining agreement 
I'm reading, I'm here on page 11 on line four to prohibit a collective bargaining agreement between an agency and an officer that would um, include a prohibition on the exchange of information between the employing agency and another agency about the officer's performance at the employing agency. So that moving forward, um, collective bargaining agreements would not be able to include those types of non-disclosure agreements. Um, so just, just to put a slightly, um, slightly finer point on it or a different point on it, I wanted to make sure that we are honoring the fact that there may be um, there may be contracts under which uh, these types of non-disclosure agreements are allowable currently. And we're not seeking to do anything about current contracts that uh, that that may be uh, that may allow the execution of a non-disclosure agreement that would keep um, an officer's discipline at one agency from being shared with a future employer. Um, but in the interest of uh, moving forward and uh, making sure that law enforcement agencies have all the information at their fingertips, we just want to make sure that uh, that those kinds of non-disclosure agreements are. Uh, are no longer used in the future. Thank you. And related on page, uh, in section 9b, on page 11, starting on line 14, there is um, relatedly that transitional provision to say that that new uh, prohibition on in including for any CBA to have a prohibition on the exchange of information um, would not apply to a CBA that took effect prior to the effective date of this uh, new requirement, but would apply to any CBA that takes effect on and after the effective date of that section as a transitional provision. And Betsy Ann, can you just um, remind me if if this is indeed the, the way these words work on the page? Um, it was not my intention that um, that that any disciplinary action between an officer and their employing agency would be able to be made public necessarily by this, but that it would have to be shared law enforcement agency to law enforcement agency. So not to splash across the headlines, but just to make sure that a new um, you know, hiring agency has all the information. Yes, yeah, thanks for that reminder. As Currently written, um, it does just uh, address the agreements, but I think I failed to make that completely explicit that that language cannot be shared publicly. So if you committee will pursue this, um, I will make a note to make that explicit that any other confidentiality um, requirements would need to be maintained by the agency that receives the information. I could add that language because I don't think it, I, I did not explicitly add it here. So if you- I think that would be helpful. Okay. And unless the committee objects in some way, um, I would say, go ahead and work on making that more explicit. But he's diving to their hand. I think I, I will work with our labor attorney and I can also, there's also language currently in law that I could um, point to as an example for maintaining the confidentiality of any privileged information. Thank you. <clears throat> On page 12 in new, in section A, um, this was the language that as passed the Senate provided that um, agencies that use body cams need to comply with the LEAB body, model body cam policy. Um, you had already discussed in your previous draft, making this clearer that the requirement um, to have and use a model, a model body cam policy is only if an agency or its officers are actually using body cam. It's not a requirement for all agencies to use body cams. Um, this draft would, um, instead of having the LEAB establish the policy, which they did in 2016, um, this would instead provide that it's the council who establishes a mod model body camera policy um, so that any 
officer who is authorized to use a body cam uh, need to follow the council's model body camera policy. Um, so you'll see relatedly, there's language in that section 10A report back where the, um, as passed the Senate would require the LEAB to propose any revisions to its 2016 model body camera policy that would be changed accordingly to the council since this draft would give the council the authority to establish the model body camera policy instead of the LEAB. Jim Harrison. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Betsy Ann, um, any background as to why we're switching the policy from the leave to the council? I'm not sure it makes a lot of difference to me personally, but I'm just curious. This is the first time I've heard the change going to the council. Yeah, I would be happy to uh, open that up for a little bit of committee discussion and, and welcome others to weigh in with their thoughts on this. Um, the, uh, the, the thought with respect to having the council take on this responsibility is that the council is going to be reformulated as a, as a council that has both civilian and law enforcement expertise on it. And since there are so many issues with respect to the use of body cameras that, um, that have uh, a lot of civilian interests and civilian implications, um, my thought was that, uh, that the council that has more balance might be the better entity to create that model policy. Happy to have other folks weigh in if they have thoughts or questions or just open this up for general committee discussion right now. Rob's unmuted. Is that a hand raise as well? <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just, uh, what's the makeup of the league now? Do they have, it's got to be all members of the league? You know? Yeah, the law enforcement advisory board is all law enforcement. Yeah. Yeah, for the most part. Yeah, you can see the, um, for reference, the LEAB is addressed also in this bill uh, because it would be getting moved from where it currently lives in statute to where it really belongs um, because it is an entity under the Department of Public Safety. You can look at the current uh, or at the membership of the LEAB on page 24 if it's helpful for this discussion. Um, so what this part of the bill is doing is deleting the LEAB where it's at in Title 24 because it just doesn't belong there. That's the municipal law title and moving it under uh, the chapter in Title 20 regulating the Department of Public Safety because as originally created and as this language would Today, um, the LEAB is created within the Department of Public Safety to advise the Commissioner of Public Safety, the Governor, and the General Assembly on issues involving the cooperation and coordination of all agencies that exercise law enforcement responsibilities. So it is a focus on law enforcement. Um, the membership would change, would remain mostly the same as the Senate did propose adding a few new members to the LEAB. Um, one of them being, I can, if I go to the section by section summary, I can tell you for certain, because it's not easy to tell from the bill um, as currently written as a strike all. But I know the chief of the Capitol Police would be one member that was added. I believe another member that was added is, um, let's see, someone from, I shouldn't guess, DMV perhaps. I can tell you um, with certainty in a second. But if you look at the language of the LEAB or the, the membership of the LEAB, it really is a focus on law enforcement, um, except you've got the member, uh, the Defender General also gets a seat and um, they're the US Attorney and the AG also have a seat there to discuss law enforcement issues and BLCT. Rob, any follow-up? 
No, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Betsy Ann. Uh, Marcia Gardner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I believe that the governor's executive order recommends that the commissioner of DPS, um, and I'll say Betsy Ann did this analysis for me. I wanted to see the comparison between the governor's executive order and the bill that we have before us. And um, uh, the governor's executive order says that the commissioner of DPS will recommend a model body camera policy to the Criminal Justice Training Council. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for raising that, uh, Representative Gardner, uh, and to Andrea also for reposting all these documents. If you are interested in the executive order, it's posted there too, and the body camera language is in Section D with that requirement, just as you stated, um, Representative Garner, for Commissioner of DPS to represent, uh, propose a model body cam policy to the council. Any other questions on body cam policy? All right, moving on. I will move on. I'm on page 12, line 13 in the uh, what's labeled as section A. Um, this would be a prohibition on officers using any facial recognition or other biometric matching technology, um, uh, facial surveillance techniques, for example. Um, I am, I just wanted to give you a heads up. I am running this language by our judiciary attorneys because I did see when um, reviewing the statutes that it does appear in your current law, drone law, um, and I provided a link to it there. It's the 20 VSA 2622. Um, there's currently a prohibition that when law enforcement uh, uses drones, those drones cannot use the facial recognition technology or other biometric matching technology unless the on the drone, unless the drone is not being used for uh, related to a crime, for example, if it's doing a search and rescue um, a mission, or if it's allowed pursuant to warrant. Um, so it does appear that currently um, the a warrant may permit a drone to have facial recognition technology. So I just want to put that on your radar if you will pursue a prohibition on um, facial recognition Great facial recognition tech um, that there does appear to be that current law requirement uh, authority to for drones to include that. I'm also I, I will also just further discuss to see if there are any other issues with um, with our judiciary attorneys as to this prohibition on uh, law enforcement use of facial recognition technology. Thank you. I appreciate that, um, Jim Harrison. Thank you. Uh, Betsy Ann, does the other biometric matching technology uh, interfere with fingerprints? That's a great question. Um, I didn't think that I didn't think of that. Um, so I'll put that on the to the question of how that would be interpreted and whether there needs to be any clarification on that, if you will pursue that. Um, this prohibition. And additionally, I, I recall the conversation on drones from a prior bill mm -hmm. um, and that they can be used for search and rescue. Um, would that also allow facial recognition or are we taking that out somehow? That's another good point because right now that this language is only about um, exceptions under the drone law. So um, that, that drone law could be a potential model um, for any exceptions you wanna have here if you do wanna pursue this. So those are great points. Um, and, I, and I guess the last question, and this is probably a, a broader conversation, um, I don't know if we, if other states um, prohibit facial recognition, um, and if so, 
um, what's the what's the primary reason for that? Um, it, it, it it's just a broad question. I don't know that we use it today. I'm just wondering. Um, I just I if we're trying to catch a bad apple, I hate to tie our hand behind our back. Um, that's all. Just a, a question. I can speak to the um, the second part of your question as to uh, other parts of the law. The only other the pr prohibition that I'm aware of right now is in um, the DMV statute. It's 23 VSA. I, sec I think it's section 364 C that prohibits um, DMV from um, embedding in any of its practices the use of uh, biometric matching technology. But that's um, beyond just law enforcement, but that's just DMV practices generally. Do, do we know if other states prohibit um, facial recognition for law enforcement? The um, only information that I have at this point was from your testimony last week about um, some of the, I think, I don't know if it was states uh, state overall, but there were some towns, I think, that were um, moving forward with prohibiting it. And in New York, a moratorium on school resource officers using it. Um, but I would have to look further as to whether there are, to confirm whether there are state prohibitions elsewhere on using this. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that it's being used. I, I, and I just, I would want some input from law enforcement whether or not down the road that makes it harder um, to uh, catch criminals that's all um, it's just some I, I get the concern you know but I guess I look at it if you're not doing anything wrong don't worry about the surveillance camera um, so that's just me thank you so I think one of the concerns that we heard in um, in testimony that led to this being added is that facial recognition technology um, appears to be much less accurate with uh, with African uh, faces, African descent, and so that using facial recognition technology that doesn't as accurately uh, identify a black or brown person um, as it might a white person uh, could inadvertently lead to um, uh, lead to mistakes being made and uh, unfair treatment of certain people. Okay, and that's a fair concern. Thank you. Any other questions from committee members? Marsha, you're unmuted. Do you, did you have a question? No, I do not. Thank okay. You. Just read, trying to read all the cues in, in this little Zoom room that we have going on here. Um, go ahead, Betsy Ann. All right, I'm on page 13. And this is uh, just a reminder, this was um, the red strike through came from your draft 1.1 um, as passed the Senate this language would have um, um, amended the definition of what constitutes category B, unprofessional conduct. Um, and you had already addressed that issue in S219. So it, it's done and taken care of. So you don't need this language in this bill because you've already made that policy decision in S219, um, the provisions of which took effect on September 1. So I will continue to move on. I'm on page 15. Oh, I'm going to pause for representation. Go ahead, Jim. I'm sorry. Um, did I think when we left last, uh, the chair was going to reach out to judiciary to see if they were looking at the unprofessional conduct and the criminal penalty related here um, on the use of force. Uh, with judiciary to see if they were addressing how we left 219. Um, I don't believe that I've gotten a full sense of what they're doing yet. They are working on that in the context of the bill that we asked to be relieved of um, 
but I don't have an update yet from them on exactly what they're doing. Okay, no, thank you. I just didn't want to be one of these and then it falls through the cracks, that's all. If we're- CN would never to... let us uh, okay. <laughs> forget <laughs> such an important piece. <laughs> right, thank you. And I've, I've been speaking with um, one of our judiciary attorneys, who's, Brian, who's handling S-119. I do know that they, um, House Judiciary is focusing on use of force and a use of force policy. Um, so I, 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 I can also try, I'll reach out to confirm with her whether they're addressing that sunset on the crimes related to force. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna keep going. Um, we are on page 15. And just a reminder in regard, this is the bill that would not be changing this draft from the as passed Senate version um, that would require an agency to alert the council when it receives a credible complaint alleging that an officer committed category B conduct um, instead of the current law language that says that the agency only reports to the council after they go through the process of conducting a whole valid investigation. But that language as passed Senate would not change in this draft. I'm on page 16 and on line seven. Um, this language would not change, but as a reminder, this would require the council to provide a copy of any report it receives from an agency, including its um, investigative report and any supporting documents um, to the council advisory committee. Um, which would recommend an appropriate action to take in regard to an officer's the subject of that report. Um, the Council Advisory Committee already exists in law. You enacted it as part of Act 56. It is the four members who do not have a law enforcement connection and the fifth member is a retired officer. Section 10A contains those report back, reports back from a variety of entities on law enforcement issues. And the first change that would um, happen to this language as proposed on page 16 on line 20 is to give the council more time uh, to report back. So overall, um, the variety of entities that have to report back under this section would need to report to the GovOps committees by January 15th of next year. But the council has its new membership, it's getting its new executive director. And so the suggestion is to give the council more time to report back and specifically to state that its initial, they would have a progress report that would only need to be verbal and then any follow-up recommendations thereafter. And so this language, um, from bottom of page 16 to the top of 17 would say that for the council's report, um, the council is not required to submit a verbal progress report until March 1 and any recommendations for legislative action um, until April 1 to just give them additional time um, as they're going through this transition. On page 17, um, so the bill sets out the different topics that different agencies have to report on. The first topic is in regard to law enforcement officer qualifications. No change to 1A where the LEAB would be recommending universal standards for interviewing and hiring new officers. Um, on line nine, that's just a technical correction because if the introductory language would already establish um, the Criminal Justice Training Council is being referred to as counsel and parens. You don't need to state it again here on line nine. So that's the only change there to the council. Um, but what you will see in this subdivision 1B and in other places is to specify um, that in addition to 
the entities that the Senate has already um, described that the variety of entities need to consult with. This would state that the council would also have to consult with statewide racial justice groups and statewide groups representing people who experience mental conditions and psychiatric disabilities when the council um, is consulting with entities um, in order to review officer law enforcement applicants um, current exams for cultural sensitivities and overall appropriateness. In subdivision two, there is also a requirement for recommendations on law officer training. So here again, the council would be required to consult with uh, specified entities and this um, revised language would say that those entities would include statewide racial justice groups and statewide groups representing people who experience mental conditions and psychiatric disabilities. Um, and this recommendation from the council is to review at the top of page 18, the current requirements for basic and annual in-service training in order to determine whether appropriate training is provided in the areas of cultural awareness, implicit bias, de-escalation, recognition of and appropriately responding to individuals with a mental condition and whether that training is embedded into training on other policing policies such as traffic stops and searches. In your prior draft, I had made a note that your S219, um, which is now Act 147, um, stated in the introductory language that the legislature is committed to evaluating whether and how to gather data regarding interactions between uh, officers and people with mental health issues. And only a follow-up note um, for our conversation is that, as we were discussing earlier, there is that current law um, creation of the Mental Health Crisis Response Commission and that requirement within that statute that created the commission for agencies to report um, officer interactions in a mental health crisis that resulted in death or bodily injury. So at least part of that reporting is happening now. And I was just providing that note with the 9-15-20 date just for reference. But otherwise, no changes to that language. Um, just related to um, this recommendation on training in page 18, line seven, um, as passed the Senate, the bill would say that after the council reviews the current training um, requirements for officers, the council would be re required to recommend any amendments to statutorily required training that might not be necessary for all officers because while the council gets to establish some of the, the training requirements for officers um, through its rulemaking authority and general authority that statute grants to the council to approve training, um, there, the statute does control some of the hours of training that all officers have to receive. And so the question would be whether some of those statutory requirements are still necessary for all officers. We're still on training. Um, on page 18, line 11, um, this language as passed the Senate would require the council, the LEAB and DPS to consult with the VLCT and any other interested stakeholders to determine whether the council should be reestablished re within a state agency or other oversight entity. And the suggestion is to remove the language that would require a report back on whether the police academy should be relocated to a different area of the state from where it currently is. So eliminating that, um, but maintaining um, the requirement for them to recommend um, whether there should be more flexibility in the residential and field training required of law enforcement applicants, um, including whether they should be able to satisfy some aspects of basic training through experiential learning. And I think that's getting back to that um, basic training requirement of the 16 weeks um, with the overnight requirement. I'm on page 19. The third topic for reports back is models of civilian oversight. 
um, requiring the AG's office overall to consult with um, entities in recommending one or more models of civilian oversight of law enforcement. And the suggestion for this revised draft is to require the AG's office to specifically consult with the Vermont Law School Center for Justice Reform um, and statewide racial justice groups and statewide groups representing people who experience mental conditions and psychiatric disabilities. And similarly in a number four, the topic of reporting allegations of uh, officer misconduct. Again, this is a requirement on for AG's office to consult with specified entities and the suggestion is to add there specifically statewide racial justice groups and statewide groups running, representing people who experience mental conditions and psychiatric disabilities. Um, with the overall uh, point of this report back is identifying a central point for reporting allegations of officer misconduct. Maybe the council or another entity and how the allegations should be handled. Number five here uh, is not revised as passed the Senate. Um, this is about access to complaint information. Um, this duty would be on the Council Advisory Committee um, to consult with the Secretary of State, Human Rights Commission, ACLU, and other interested parties in reviewing public access to records relating to allegations of officer misconduct and substantiations. I'm on page 20 and the sixth topic is body cams and related to the change earlier in the bill that would have the council adopting the model body cam policy rather than the LEAB. This would similarly change that. Um, the bill as passed the Senate said that the LEAB would report any changes it deems necessary to the model policy that it established in 2016. And instead it would say that the council shall recommend a model body camera policy for use by agencies and officers. And this section goes on to say that after consulting with the Secretary of State, Human Rights Commission, ACLU, and adding statewide racial justice groups and statewide groups representing people who experience mental conditions and psychiatric disabilities and other parties, the council would have to specifically recommend policies for responding to public records requests for footage and the timelines respond, how and what footage is redacted, length of footage retention and storage. And then relatedly, um, in regard to being able to obtain body cameras, this subdivision B goes on to say that DPS would consult with now the council since it would be given this model body cam policy authority and the LEAB to investigate the possibility of a statewide group purchasing contract for body cams in central storage locations. Uh, the DPS would have to, uh, if it recommends a group, it would have to detail its recommended structure and operation. So this is going, I, I understood, to go to the cost of obtaining and um, maintaining body cams in the footage and whether it could be cheaper to have a group purchasing um, entity. The last subject for a report back is on military equipment and the language as passed the Senate would have required um, after an opportunity for community involvement and feedback, the LEAB to recommend a statewide policy on officers use of military equipment and the suggestion for this draft is to instead say it would be the council that would recommend a statewide policy on officers acquisition of military equipment. So not use of, but what could be acquired. And the council would make that recommendation. All right, we're out of the recommendation section. I'm on page 21. Now this bill would get into uh, topics relating to state data collection and analysis. And there's that new section B that you already discussed earlier that would require GAC to consult with the executive director of racial equity, social equity caucus, and the chief performance officer, accept recommendations from other entities in order to approve by March 1st, 
population level indicators that demonstrate the quality of life for Vermonters who are BIPOC, as those indicators relate to the current quality of life outcomes set forth in 2311B. And then once approved, the CPO would report on those indicators in the state outcomes report. Jim Harrison. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a question on style. I'm not sure what it means of substance, but we have um, a lot of different caucuses in the legislature. Um, we can, any of us can form one, you know, at a whim. Um, we could have, you know, those that like Boston cream donuts. Um, I mean, we just formed a new one last week for the National Guard. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen um, statutory language that um, referred to one of those caucuses um, in terms of stat, we, we refer to different groups, but I'm just curious, is that unusual or is it just something I've never paid attention to before? And, and do we set any kind of precedent by doing that? Um, I'm a member of the tourism caucus. Uh, does that mean we should have a seat at the table when um, the tourism commissioner is developing their marketing plans? I don't know. Um, I'm just asking the question. I don't know how often it is used um, to refer to spaces. Um, it's a decision if you would think it is a pro. Sorry, my internet. I got the internet message. Sorry. Um, there's nothing prohibiting you from um, mentioning or, or referencing a specific caucus. Um, I would see that as a policy decision for you to make if you wanted to do that. Okay, uh, thank you. I just I just raise a caution. We're going down this path. Uh, we're other caucus groups might want to be referred to in the statute to. Um, and, and, and the challenge with caucuses is they're self-selected. Um, so um, we just, I think we need to be cautious of that. Hal Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to clarify that the Social Equity Caucus involves about 75 legislators. So it's a very strong voice. And I think it's appropriate to be uh, part of, of, of this uh, this part of the bill because I think it really would add a lot of value. All right, is your internet back in uh, in tip top shape again? I think so for now. Um, I'm on page 22 in a potential news section, what's labeled as C right now. Um, this goes to Representative Donahue's specific request to amend the language that you included in S219 um, that would say, and this new language in S219 took a, will take effect on January 1 of next year. Um, to require this new language would require the secretary of administration or designee to review all grants from an agency of the state to a local law enforcement agency or constable um, and to approve grants only if the agency or constable has complied with the race dating reporter requ reporting requirements that are required by law um, and representative donahue's specific um, request to add and the current law requirement um, for reporting death or serious bodily injuries um, involving a law enforcement officer responding to a mental health crisis. So this is taken directly from uh, Representative Donahue's proposal. The one thing that I will note here is um, just double checking what your or original intent was um, because I noticed 
under your language in S219 that you can see here on page 22 on line five, it refers only to local law enforcement agencies, which I would read to mean only municipal police departments and wouldn't include a county sheriff, for example, or um, any of our other state law enforcement agencies. Um, and so I uh, just wanted to double check whether you did intend to limit it in that way to only um, local agencies or whether you meant to expand it to all law enforcement agencies. And if it's all law enforcement agencies and you wanted to pursue this amendment, you could make that correction here. Uh, that would be my intention. Folks are welcome to dive in with an objection and we can arm wrestle for it. Rob? Thank you, Madam Chair. I was going to see if that worked. It sure did. <laughs> I'm watching. <laughs> um, I, I would agree that if we're going to do this, that it should apply to all law enforcement agencies. I'm still questioning as to if that winds up being the end result is there examples where it hasn't been reported already? Um, I, I guess I'm failing to understand the need for this. Again, if that's the end result, it would seem to me that those things are already being addressed and I guess reported. Thank you. I don't recall the specific testimony, but I feel like there was um a, a bit of concern about the quality and consistency of reporting but um, i'd have to go back through my notes well that I, I i do agree with madam chair there i think we had a lot of discussion around that for sure um my question is just do we need to carve this out when i would say that regardless of what the motivation was, if that's the final outcome, it seems like it would be reported. But I'm on page 22 and just a note on line 12. This is just a technical correction to get rid of that reader assistance heading regarding the VCIC because up above this portion of the bill would refer more generally to data collection and analysis of which the VCIC language is a part. So it's just um, putting this section 11 under the overall broader um, topic of data collection analysis. This section 11 has passed the Senate contains the requirement for the VCIC to establish and provide training on a uniform of list of definitions that agencies would use when entering data into their system of records, either Spillman or Valcor, and requiring every officer to use those definitions when entering data into their agency system. The suggestion on page 23 in the new language is that um, on line 10, when the VCIC comes up with these definitions, um, it would be in consultation with the Vermont Crime Research Group, statewide racial justice groups, and statewide groups representing people who experience mental conditions and psychiatric disabilities as they come up with these definitions. So we can forward along through the LEAB provisions, again, just repealing where they currently are in Title 24, which is a municipal law, putting them where they belong, which is in Title 20 in the DPS chapter because they're created under DPS, and then maintaining the Senate's um, changes to the membership of the LEAB. I think it was adding the chief of the Capitol Police and then um, adding a a new member, the 18, a law enforcement officer appointed by the president of the VSEA. And I just have to go back and double check the summary to see what other, um, if there are any other members that would be added that are new. Um, I know I put that in your section by section summary, just don't have that at my fingertips. But otherwise, 
aside from adding a few members, um, the only changes that would otherwise be made to the LEAB's current statute is just updating the quorum um, accordingly to reflect the number of uh, members. And then just recodification. Um, but otherwise, no changes. I know we're up on one o'clock, Madam Chair. So I'm just going to quickly scroll through to get to the DPS dispatch language, um, which starts on page 25 or 27, pardon me. So as the bill passed the Senate, um, it would have required DPS to adopt rules setting forth the rates that DPS can charge for dispatch. They already have the statutory authority to charge for dispatch, but this would say the DPS would have to have uh, rules to provide its fee structure and that those rules could not be imposed until three years after adoption. Um, what this language would be doing is removing that rulemaking authority and prohibiting DPS from charging rates until the General Assembly establishes a fee structure. In amending these statutes, I just wanted to note that I am only providing for reference at the bottom of page 27, starting on line 20, the current law language for the different charges that DPS can charge for some of the services that it offers and updates this statute, but no changes to those current law authorities. I'm just providing them for reference. Um, but you can see the language that allows DPS to charge for dispatch begins in current law on page 28, line 17. There's that current dispatch charging authority. You can see it currently allows the Commissioner of Public Safety to enter into contractual arrangements to perform dispatching functions for state, municipal, or other emergency services, establishing charges sufficient to recover the cost of dispatching. What this language would do at the top of page 29 is remove the uh, a rule adoption language. Um, I'm just going to scroll through to point out the substantive language is on page 31 to remove the section, the Senate's proposed section 17, which addressed that rulemaking uh, authority to charge dispatch rates. And this potential new language in section D here on page 31, line nine, would say that notwithstanding the provisions of that prior subsection or any other provision of law to the contrary, DPS shall not charge to recover the costs of any contractual arrangements to perform dispatching functions for state, municipal, or other emergency services until the General Assembly enacts in law the fee structure for those charges and it would require DPS by January to consult with VLCT, the EMS Advisory Committee, Vermont Police Chiefs Association, the State Firefighters Association, and local emergency medical service, police and fire agencies in order to recommend by that January 15 date um, to the GovOps and Ways and Means and Finance an equitable dispatch fee structure for the department to charge for dispatching EMS, police and fire service and potential funding mechanisms for those charges that do not rely on property taxes. So overall, this language is designed to maintain the authority of DPS to contract for dispatch, but to put um, a temporary hold on their authority to charge for those dispatch functions until the General Assembly establishes the fee structure for them. Jim Harrison. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Betsy Ann, I just want to make sure I understand this. So even though we're leaving in statute their ability to contract and charge, we're saying they can't charge right now. Is that correct? That is correct. And I, I'm, I went back and forth about how to structure this. I mean, the law is the law. The session law would control if you enacted it in this way, so that even though statute says that they can charge, there would be that session law that would be in place as prohibiting them from charging. Another option is just to do it directly and amend the statute and then go back in the future and amend it again once you establish the fee structure. Um, so it's just an, one way or the other of doing it. It should not make a... Um, have an, a substantive um, difference in how the law is executed because session law has the same force and effect of statutory law. But if members would be more comfortable with removing from statute 
the current ability to charge and then enacting at a later time charging authority once you have the fee structure set that's just another way of going about doing the same thing yeah i i don't have any preconceived notion i i you're the lawyer so i would trust i just want to make sure i understand it correctly um and i think you know this change uh is good and it allows more time for conversation and discussion about whatever is decided to go down the road i i would just flag the january 15 2021 which is only a couple months away for getting all of these groups on the same page um easier said than done um and i'm sure public safety has their hands full with a lot of covid related issues right now so it just you know the world's not going to end if uh if this isn't done by January 15th. Thank you. Any other questions committee on this section of the bill? All right, we are past time. So thank you, Betsy Ann. Um, we will come back to this again tomorrow. And in the meantime, if there are other um, perspectives that you would like to hear from as we work through language on this bill, you know how to reach me. All right, we are back in committee, I believe at 8.30 tomorrow morning, is that correct? No, all right, I'm seeing some heads nodding. That means we're on the same page. Great. Um, give me a shout if you need me for anything this afternoon. And thank you so much, Betsy Ann. And thanks again, Coach, for being with us today. We'll see you. Oh, Mike Marwicki has his hand up. Go ahead, Mike. Just a quick one. Uh, at nine o'clock tomorrow, I have to, I'll have to leave and and go check in on Senate Resources, Senate Chris Bray's committee. Senate Natural. Okay. Natural Resources. Um, I don't know if I'll be needed, but um, I'll be there for a little bit, hopefully. Great. Thanks. All right. Super. All right. Everybody have a good rest of your day.